All right. Uh, well, once again, welcome everyone. Um, my name is David Greaves. This is the first meeting for uh, Haysboro Avenue under the Neighborhood Street Traffic Calming Program. Um, it's June 5th, 2024, and we're meeting virtually at 6.30 p.m. Um, we're going to start with a kind of broad overview of the program, um, just sort of answer any general questions first, um, and that starts with what is traffic calming. Um, so in Nashville, this is a program that focuses heavily on residential streets. Um, so as Council Member Benedict mentioned, kind of not the commercial corridors, certainly not like large arterial roads, um, but neighborhoods where people are living. Um, is, is really where we'd like to see those slower speeds for the most part. Um, we prefer physical solutions to encourage lower speeds and, and we prefer to do that over significant lengths. So what that means is um, we have uh, vertical measures tools in our toolbox that we can implement um, that, that'll uh, encourage lower speeds. And we try not to do this like one block at a time. We usually choose either entire streets or um, you know sections of streets that are several blocks long with um, you know fairly logical places to to start and stop a project. Um, and the primary goal, is, as I've alluded to, is uh, speed reduction, um, and we'll take a look at why that's so important in a couple of slides. Um, but before then, we can review the three E's of traffic calming: those being uh, education, enforcement, and engineering. Uh, you'll notice I have engineering uh, big bold and underlined. And the reason for that is that component is what NDOT has the most ability to control and affect with um, their designs and their work. Um, certainly, we're able to help educate people. Um, this meeting is, is kind of an example of that. We're going to talk about why going uh, slow is important for safety. Um, but in reality, we can't always guarantee that we'll be able to reach everyone, um, you know, and, and, you know, ask that they drive slowly. Um, so we prefer to design solutions to make that happen rather than try to, you know, just ask everyone to. And then uh, finally, there's, of course, enforcement. Uh, we all know that if you're caught speeding, you might get a ticket from a police officer. Um, out of the three of these, this is the one that we don't have a whole lot of ability to affect. And um, while it'd be great if Metro Police Department was able to hang out on every neighborhood street and, and be writing tickets to those who are speeding, um, they just don't have anywhere near the resources necessary for, for that to be the case. Um, so back to safety and, and speeds, uh, the traffic calming program is, is part of um, the broader vision zero that uh, the city of Nashville is pursuing. Um, and for anyone who may not be aware, vision zero is the um, idea that nobody should have to die or be fatally injured on um, you know, public roadways in, in the city. So where that plugs into traffic calming is um, sort of backing up why we try to reduce speeds and, and why we're so focused on that. Um, the main reason is uh, spelled out in this infographic on the screen here. So we can see that if um, you know, you're walking and are hit by a car that's going 25 miles an hour, you have an 89% chance of, of surviving that encounter. Now, certainly that's not as high as, as I'd like it to be, um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't Roll, roll a dice like that and, and feel great about it. But as um, those speeds increase uh, up to 35 and then 45 miles an hour, that chance of survival um, goes way down. So on streets where we see people driving kind of between that 35, 45 mile an hour range, and we know that this is a spot where people live and like to walk, that indicates to us that, um, you know, we really ought to do something to, to fix that situation. Um, this is a really popular program. Um, so when Haysboro was selected in March of 2023, um, scratch that, you were selected in uh, March of 2024. That was this spring. Um, there were about 40, 480 neighborhood streets who had applied and were still waiting to be selected. Um, so the map off to the right shows every traffic calming project in Nashville. Um, the dark blue is 
ones that have been implemented already. Um, so we've made some significant progress in the last year or so. And then those thinner magenta lines are ones who have applied but have not yet been selected. Uh, there's a couple other colors if you if you squint and, and zoom in that we'll take a look at later. Um, those just represent different stages of the process between um, application and implementation. Um, in the spring of 2024, we were able to select 25 neighborhood streets. Haysboro was one of them. Um, that, of course, indicating that out of all of these 480 streets waiting for traffic calming, um, you all rose to the top as a street that was most in need. Um, so there are a few things that the traffic calming program is able to do. Um, we've got a, a toolbox and some options we're going to talk about a little later in the presentation. But there are all kinds of things um, that we're not able to do. Um, so before we go too much further, I just want to make sure everyone is aware that Hub Nashville is a resource available to anyone in the city to connect with Metro government and, and make requests for all sorts of things. Um, I think you can submit for traffic calming here or at least make a, a complaint relative to it. Um, really any street and road related issue ought to be covered here, um, but also things that don't pertain to transportation. Um, I know that flooding is something that you can report on Hub and, and if I heard correctly, that's something that um, you know this neighborhood has experienced a little bit of in the recent past. So I'm, I'm sorry to hear that as well. Um, any questions about what I've covered before we start talking about um, kind of that prioritization process? Uh, I, I like to pause every few minutes to just make sure um, I'm not charging ahead too quickly. Uh, sounds like no. Um, just as a announcement, I suppose, if, if a question does come up and, and you prefer to ask it immediately, uh, feel free to use the chat. I've got that window open, so I'll see it as I'm, as I'm presenting. Um, but I'll, I'll also pause a couple more times to, to take questions before we wrap up. So moving on to how the prioritization process works, um, we collect uh, several data points after a street has applied, um, those being uh, vehicular speeds, um, how many cars are driving, that's volume, and between those two, that's almost three quarters of the, the scoring system we use. And the reason we pay attention to those two things so heavily is because um, how fast cars are going and how many cars are going fast are the two things that sort of combine to create the, the danger and discomfort um, that people might experience on, on their street. Uh, but we do like to take a couple other factors into consideration as well. Um, the next being vulnerable user injury or fatality. So if any at any time in the recent past, um, there's been an accident with a, a pedestrian, uh, we'll be able to see that and we take that um, and, and boost that score a little bit so that, um, you know, say the day we went out and measured, it wasn't exactly a bad day. Um, if there's already been crashes on your road, we understand that, um, you know, that's indicative of a problem. Um, we also consider non-driver accommodations. That's that purple slice, that 10%. Um, basically, that's asking is, is there a sidewalk or, or isn't there? Um, I know on Haysboro, you all, for the most part, don't have sidewalks. Um, so you got a bit of a boost in the scoring because of that. Um, so we, we always like to take into consideration the fact that on streets without sidewalks, you don't have any other options for where to walk besides the road. And of course, that, that means we'd like to, you know, make sure everyone's driving especially safely. And then that last 5%, um, that's trip destination. So if you have a park nearby or a school nearby or both or multiple of both, um, that all goes into the equation and, and kind of nudges that score up um, that 5%. Uh, just because we know that schools um, have a, a special need to be safe in their vicinity. And then parks are, are also, um, you know, generators of pedestrian trips. Um, all right, so I mentioned we collected some data. Uh, what we're looking at here is a couple of those um, points. So on Haysboro, the section is from Gallatin Pike all the way up to Brush Hill Road, so the whole street. 
Um, we measured a prevailing speed or 85th percentile speed of 38 miles an hour. Um, and what that statistic means is that 15% of people that drove by, they were going faster than, than 38 and then 85% um, were going you know, slower or 38 miles an hour. And that is pretty high um, relative to other streets in the program. Um, and you'll have a volume that is sort of in the like lower normal range. Um, we do projects in the traffic calming program on streets up to around 5,000 vehicles per day before they get um, you know, kicked out for being too busy for speed cushions to be appropriate. Um, but 1,800 or so is, isn't super, super busy, but it's, it's also quite a bit of, of traffic. Um, and I know that it was mentioned that uh, some streets use Haysboro to get to Gallatin Pike, and, and that sort of makes that number make a little bit of sense. Right. Um, it's also a rather narrow road relative to many of the neighborhood streets. I'm sure you all know that it's about, um, you know, two lanes, but not a lot of room to, you know, park on the side and certainly not um, a whole lot of room to like walk without sharing that space with, with vehicles. Um, this is a map. So, as I mentioned before, the section that was chosen is all the way from Gallatin Pike to Brush Hill. Um, what we're looking at here is a screenshot of NDOT's traffic calming tracker. So that's an online tool that shows where the projects are in the city. So like I mentioned, um, the thin magenta lines, those are ones who have submitted an application but have not yet been selected. Um, that kind of light green that you see on Richmond and then Haysboro as well, that's you've been selected and we're in the kind of meeting and design phase. Um, Brush Hill Road, you'll see, is sort of a darker teal color. Um, what that means is that the ballot for Brush Hill has closed, but we have not gotten around to building it yet. So they have um, approved their traffic calming design, but we're still, um, you know, working on getting them to uh, a complete construction project. Um, any questions about what I've covered so far before we jump into the, the toolkit, some of the options we have on, on Haysboro? All right, charge ahead. Um, so as many people are, are probably aware by now, NDOT really prefers to start with speed cushions as kind of the, the go-to design implement. Um, Oh, I see we've got a question in the chat about um, kind of the timeline of these projects. And I'll ask you to be patient um, because we've got a slide a little later that, that we'll review all the steps and, and talk about some, some expectations on how long this will take. Uh, so if you don't mind, um, we'll, we'll get to that soon. Anyway, um, speed cushions are modular uh, rubber materials. Um, basically, it's a bunch of pieces that fit together like Legos, and, and we bolt them to the asphalt. Um, they act like speed bumps, but they're they're stretched way out to either seven, ten and a half, or fourteen feet long. And the reason for that is, um, you know, speed bumps are often found in like parking lots where you want to be going really slow, kind of like five ish miles an hour. Um, we don't want people going that slow over, over speed cushions. Um, so the target speed of these devices is around 20 miles an hour. So if you're going around 20 miles an hour, you ought to be able to um, you know, hit these and kind of comfortably traverse them. Um, if you're going much more than that, uh, they'll start to um, impact your vehicle and your ride more. And when I say impact, I don't mean damage. Just it'll, it'll give you a little jolt as you, you go up and over it. Um, they're six feet long and, or six feet wide, that is, and, and that's deliberate. Um, I'll skip ahead to speed tables to give us a kind of reference point, but essentially these are speed cushions that stretch all the way across the road. And those gaps that I'm talking about, um, are really the only difference there. So the reason that we don't prefer speed tables over cushions is because speed cushions are designed to have uh, less of an impact on large emergency vehicles as they may be trying to go relatively fast to reach an emergency in a timely manner. So the way that works is um, with a six foot wide cushion, a smaller vehicle like a car is gonna have to 
interact with it somehow. You could maybe put like one wheel in the gap, but then your other wheels going over it or, or just hit it straight on. Um, emergency vehicles are able to, to kind of hit it straight on in their wider wheelbase will allow, um, will allow them to um, kind of hug the edges of those cushions and, and not be jolted as much. Um, so that's speed tables. Now I mentioned that MDOT um, prefers these as kind of a starting point for a traffic calming design. And the reason for that is they've, they've figured out they're a good investment. Um, so basically they've, they've installed these and then done uh, several before and after studies where they collected the speeds ahead of the speed cushion installation and then afterwards. And the charts we're looking at are the graphs of those results. Um, so we can see that the average speed um, from those studies uh, went down from 31 miles an hour to 22. And then that 85th percent speed that we talked about earlier, that came down from 37 all the way to, to 25. Um, so that was really encouraging data. Um, it, it definitely validated that the work we've been doing all this time um, you know, does have the intended effect. Uh, I will say it's not the first time we, we heard about that um, because there is national research to suggest the same. Uh, but we conducted this in Nashville just to make sure that there was nothing in particular about our city that um, would have these perform a little bit differently. Um, outside of vertical measures, there's a few other tools that we can mix in to sort of uh, supplement or, or complement the, the vertical measures. Um, one of these are radar feedback signs. Um, so I think most people who drive around have seen these before, but essentially it's a solar powered sign that um, measures your speed before you go by and it flashes it back at you. And these can be really helpful in areas um, that are prone to speeding if um, it's like on a long hill or a roadway is especially wide. Um, those are things that can sort of have people speed accidentally. Like we all know that you pick up speed on a hill and if you're not riding the brake, you may actually get going pretty fast. Um, these sort of serve as a reminder to, to those people who aren't speeding deliberately that, hey, you're you're going, you know, 10 over right now, maybe, maybe go less than that. And um, that that is sometimes an effective uh, way to control some speeds. Um, in that vein, we can also do pavement narrowly. Um, so we don't actually like get the jackhammer out and demolish any pavement, but what we'll do is paint white stripes on the edge of a roadway to kind of shrink it down to a more compact um, amount of space. That can have two benefits. Um, one, it makes it less comfortable to drive at a high speed um, because you uh, psychologically have a little bit less space to work with, even if you can you know, technically drive over the paint. Most people choose not to. Um, and it can also increase the comfort for pedestrians because if you have a little bit of space that you generally assume is not going to be impeded on, um, it can make a walk a little less stressful. Um, I will say that we don't have quite enough width on Haysboro to do a lot of this, um, because even if we go down to that bare minimum lane size, um, that's that's about the width of Haysboro that we have. Um, I'll cover some other options. Uh, these are bulb outs. So these can work pretty well on intersections that are really wide, wide enough that people are able to take turns um, at an unsafe speed. Uh, they basically work in a similar way to the narrowing. They sort of shrink that pavement down, give drivers a little bit less space to work with. And as a result, they're having to drive more um, deliberately and, and as an effect more slowly. Um, Another place that we may choose to use them is if there is a lot of parallel parking and a lot of pedestrian um, activity in the same spot. So the lower left hand corner, um, that's kind of near five points. And we didn't put these in because um, the intersection was, was so massive that it was dangerous, but we did it to make sure that people weren't parking in a way that was obscuring people trying to cross the street. Um, and then another benefit they have is they reduce the amount of pavement that one has to cross if they were walking along. Um, so I really like these, but they don't they don't quite apply everywhere. Um, usually, if if an intersection is excessively large, we'll consider it, but um, we don't, we don't always have the right scenario to to plug one of these in. 
Um, another treatment that's more suited to really wide roads is chicanes. Um, so if anyone's driven on like Fairfax over in the Hillsborough neighborhood, um, that's the street that's shown here. And essentially what's going on is we take the center line of a road and we zigzag it back and forth. Um, similar to kind of how bulb outs work, if, if a car is needing to make tight turns, it's not able to go as fast. So this is sort of a way to, to force that, um, to, to suggest that people travel a little more slowly. Um, I'd say the main downside of doing this is um, it can affect the amount of on-street parking available. Um, if you're zigging one way, uh, you're not able to park where it's zigged and then zagging back over, uh, you won't be able to park where it is zagged. Um, so if that's not a huge concern, these are a great uh, tool, um, but similar to the narrowing, I don't know if we have enough pavement to work with on, on Haysboro for this to be a, a great option. Um, last but not least, we have traffic circles. Um, these work kind of like bulb outs, but just from the inside out instead of the outside in. Uh, the idea is if we take, um, you know, pavement that's not necessary to um, make turning movements and, and dedicate it toward other things, those turning movements will, will slow way down and we'll have, um, you know, more organized intersections. All right, so that was the toolbox. Um, I've just switched to the slide where we talk about the concept we have planned for Haysboro. Um, this isn't like a fully baked design. This is basically just sort of what we have in mind. Um, we've gone ahead and placed speed cushions at a somewhat regular interval considering um, the cross streets. And we also consider things like grade. So um, there are sections on Hillsboro where the roadway is too steep for speed cushions. But luckily, we've been able to sort of um, sneak those sections in the middle of cushions and, and not have too many gaps that are like excessively long. Um, but it is uh, looking like it'll be about eight sets. And we, we have that spacing. It's between 350, 450 feet is usually the sweet spot we aim for. And the reason for that is um, it's enough space that you're not going over these constantly as you're, you're trying to get out of your neighborhood. Um, but they're not so far apart that people have the ability to speed back up to a dangerous speed, um, you know, to make up for lost time. Um, so that's sort of what we're looking at here, but I do want to pause and, and take any questions we might have about either the design we're looking at or any of the other tools we've, we've talked about. And then I'll um, let you know the next slide we're going to look at is sort of the next steps timeline. Um, you know, what happens after, after this meeting. All right, um, well, I'm happy to move on. Um, if, if anyone does have questions about, you know, what we're seeing here, uh, this isn't your last chance. We'll, we'll have some questions at the end if there are any. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and start talking about the next steps and, and feel free to, you know, ask any questions that, that you like. So this is a flow chart of generally how the program works. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it all starts with an application. So um, there were residents on Haysboro that got together and applied to NDOT to have Haysboro calmed. Um, after that is when we did that kind of prioritization and selection process. So we went out and gathered that data, um, scored every street in our queue, and then um, chose Haysboro from the top of that list. And now we are at that red circle, um, the neighborhood meeting. Um, so this was advertised through mailers to everyone on Haysboro, um, and, and here we are. So after this meeting, um, what we'll do is a site visit. Um, we're going to go out and kind of make all those measurements ourselves, taking um, grades, making sure we understand exactly how wide that pavement is so we can propose an appropriate configuration of speed cushions. Um, and ultimately, we'll refine the concept design and try to incorporate any feedback we might get at this meeting um, to, to make sure that, you know, you all are getting what, what you've asked for. Um, 
once we do that, we can go one of two ways. Um, so we can finalize our plans and post them online for you all to review and send um, our ballot postcards in the mail. So it'll be a similar mailer postcard that says, hey, it's time to vote. Do you like this project or don't you? Um, and then you've got about a six week window for doing that. Um, if there are things in this design that we think we might want to revisit, um, or you'd like to see that final product before, um, you know, we, we really like give, give the thumbs up. Um, we can schedule a second neighborhood meeting and kind of run through this presentation again, but then see those final construction plans. Um, they really like drill down into exactly where those cushions are going. Um, and with this group we have tonight, we can we can decide, you know, whether or not we want a second neighborhood meeting, or if you prefer to to just go straight to the the designing and and the voting aspect. Um. So with that, I'll pause. And if anyone feels strongly one way or another, feel free to speak up. Um. You're also welcome to uh, put it in the chat, or um, I'll, I'm happy to take emails as well. But it's uh, you know, the the floor is yours. Um, okay, I guess, is there anyone not okay with proceeding with the online ballot um, after one neighborhood meeting? All right, um, I've got one, let's proceed in the chat. Um, so we'll, we'll put a pin in that and um, have, have that be the plan. Uh, that that's usually what council member Benedict prefers as well. Um, so she'll she'll be happy that um, we're we're taking that route. So after that ballot happens, um, a successful project is one where sixty six percent of people who vote uh, vote favorably. Um, that does sound like kind of a high bar to jump over. Um, it's it's certainly not fifty percent. Um, but I will let you all know that about 95 to 96% of the traffic calming projects we propose do get approved. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, anyone who would like this to happen, uh, definitely go and make sure you vote yes. Uh, feel free to you know, talk to your neighbors, make sure they know what's going on. Um, but that's sort of how that ballot works. And then following the ballot, um, if it's successful, it'll be put into the construction queue. So a little bit of backstory on why that says eight to 10 months. Um, these do not take eight to 10 months to actually build. Um, if, if they're really moving, it, it can go up in a couple of days, maybe like a week or so, um, depending on if the signs and the cushion people are all like walking in step. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, this program is very popular. Um, so thankfully, we've been able to do a lot of traffic calming designs, and we've also been able to do a lot of, um, you know, traffic calming construction. But even with all of NDOT's efforts, there is still a pretty long like backlog of projects um, who have been approved and are waiting to um, get built. So that eight to 10 months essentially represents, um, you know, us working on building the ones who have already, um, you know, had their meetings and designs and, and are waiting for construction. Um, let's talk some details about the ballot. And again, feel free to just throw any questions you have either in the chat or um, it's fine if you want to come off mute. Um, we're, we're almost at the end. So really anything goes. Um, but when I said we would send you postcards, this image in the top left is is exactly what they'll look like. Um, so unfortunately, it it kind of has like a junk mail vibe. Um, we we don't like put any, um, you know, hey, important notice. Uh, it's just sort of hard to thread that needle of like <laughs> appearing legitimate on <laughs> on mailers like this, um, since so much junk mail does like try to trick you with. Uh, you know, urgency. So anyway, that's that. Um, 
but we'll also let council member Benedict know when we're sending these out and, and she can help you all keep an eye out for them in your mailboxes when they're on the way. Okay. Um, they each have a unique ID code. So what we do to, to figure out who we send these to is we use Metro's public records. Um, this is their mailing list generator tool. And we basically send this postcard to anyone who um, you know owns one of these lots adjacent to Hillsboro. So even if your address is on Log Cabin Road because um, you know you're on the corner, if one of your property lines is um, touching Haysboro, we'll go ahead and, and send you a mailer um, because we know that you're you know very much within the proximity of of the project. Um, so the way that unique ID works is just making sure that we send these to the right people and then the right people are coming back and, and giving us those responses. Um, if for some reason uh, you think you should have gotten a mailer and you don't, or maybe you threw one away by mistake, um, we've got that unique ID um, on file. So you're more than welcome to call the number that's on um, the postcard or on NDOT's website. Uh, and they'll be able to, you know, help you vote. We we look up people's IDs all the time, um, so certainly don't hesitate to reach out if uh, you you think that maybe your postcard was was misplaced. Um, a couple other things to cover about who is voting. Um, this is a program for residential streets. Um, so we send these to all of the. Uh, the residences, we don't usually send them to like businesses. So I don't quite remember what's on the corner of Gallatin Pike there, but it looks like um, some condos on the southern end and, and some other building on the northern end. If that were like a gas station. Oh, it is a gas station, right? Yeah, you got a okay. shell station right yeah, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I've been. Okay, so we will not send a mailer to the shell station um, because it's, you know, it's a commercial property. Um, Owners with multiple properties will get one vote, so we don't we don't send out like ten mailers if if you own ten lots. Um, and then any properties that are like clearly vacant will will be ineligible. Um, vacant, when I say that, basically just means like is there a complete building there or isn't there? We're not like um, you know doing a deep dive to make sure people are going in and out. Um, but homes like under construction, we don't usually bother sending the, the construction company um, a mailer for that one. Um, any questions about the ballot or ballot zone eligibility, anything like that? I guess I can move on to our question slide since that's that's basically where we're at. All right, well, um, we have a, a very friendly, quiet group tonight, um, so we can we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, this is a QR code to NDOT's website. Um, they've also got plenty of social media. Um, I guess I'll highlight that my contact information is on the screen here. That's, that's my email address. Um, you're more than welcome to reach out to me um, if you have any questions about the project afterwards or if your neighbors might. Um, I will ask that you also copy NDOT traffic calming at Nashville.gov um, because they like to stay in the loop um, with our communications as well. Um, but if you all don't have anything else to talk about, uh, that, that's all I've got. I really appreciate your time and um, we're looking forward to proceeding with the project. David, I will uh, say I've been on Haysboro since 1986. And right in front of my house, I have had several accidents where they've gone off the road into my neighbor's yard. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you're coming from Log Cabin up Haysboro, there's a slight curve. And if you're not paying attention, uh, if you're on your cell phone or something, you will go off into my neighbor's yard. And I've had, I would say, four or five accidents right there. Luckily, uh, none in my uh, yard, but <laughs> across from me in my neighbor's yard. And I don't know if you've driven Haysboro, but, you know, we have deep ditches uh, from Log Cabin to Brush Hill, deep ditches. Mm -hmm. 
And boy, if you go off the road, man, you're in you're in sad shape, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, well, we certainly hope if we're able to get people's speeds down um, and kind of a constant reminder, like going over a speed cushion, um, I'd, I'd like to think that would encourage people to A, go a safe speed and then B, be paying attention to where they're going. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully look forward to that that effect should uh, should this project be successful. All right, well, I've got nothing else. Um, but yeah, like I said, feel free to keep in touch. Um, it, was, it was really nice talking with y'all and, and have a good night. Thank you.